First of all, I bow down and offer my heart like flowers thousands and thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual guru. Asmadeya Paramaradatama Guru Pada Padma Anitalila Parvishta Om Vishnu Bhada Shtotara Sotasismad Rupanu Gachari Varya Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaji. Secondly, I bow down thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Guru's Guru and to his Guru and his Guru and all the great spiritual masters in our unbroken uh, disciplic succession going back thousands of years to Sri Krishna himself, the original speaker of Bhagavad Gita. And finally, I uh, offer my pranam to all of you, my very dear brothers and sisters. Bam Chakal. So far, a little bit of fun. So it's a, a great honor to be back here in this sacred space. Just, uh, just over a week, almost two weeks ago, I set out from my home, my ashram on the bank of Jibuna in Vrindavan, to meet with people in Russia, in America, We'll be traveling to Spain, Switzerland, Italy, England, Germany, and a few other places on our way back to India. And we just want to bring this priceless Vedic knowledge and not representing any type of invention or idea of my own, but just like a postman or a, a pipe, a conduit, or as a flute, produces only the music which is coming out from the heart of a musician. I simply want to be an instrument to manifest the uh, teachings of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Param Tattva, the ultimate reality, the Satchidananda Vigraha, the full embodiment of all existence, consciousness and bliss, see Krishna as his message has been passed down thousands of years through our uh, parampara, that means the generation after generation of guru to disciple, guru to disciple. So, I was very happy to hear that uh, our dear Bhaktati and all of his students had been studying Bhagavad Gita chapter 12 And the chapter 12, of course, the, is focused on the subject of Bhakti Yoga. Uh, it's very profound. And so, 
I didn't want to butt in or in interrupt in any way, so I thought I'll just go with the flow and that's what you were discussing, so why not? We'll discuss that also on our visit to this uh, sacred space. So without further ado, let's begin. There are 18 chapters in Bhagavad Gita, as you know. The first six chapters, though they touch on many subjects, predominantly deal with um, Karma Yoga. And the last six predominantly deal with Jnana Yoga. So Karma Yoga means the performing one's duties in life. Everyone has some worldly responsibilities. Do they have to be obstacle to our spiritual advancement? No, the Bhagavad Gita is telling us that by very responsibly performing our worldly duties without attachment to the results and always maintaining equanimity in the face of adversity and success also. Don't forget to be in equanimity when you're faced with success. Don't pop the champagne and start celebrating because you've lost your equilibrium. So. And Samatvam Yoga Uchate, Krishna said, Yoga is equilibrium of mind. Uh, because the, when the mind comes into a state of very peaceful equilibrium, then one can contemplate and reflect and have experiences which are not possible in the general state of distracted consciousness. So, performing one's duties, being responsible in life, and doing that as an offering to God. Hmm? Why? Because in the Vedic culture it's understood that this entire universe is one of the bodies of God. God has his divine transcendental form but he has what is described in Gita chapter 11 as his virat rup, the universal form. In other words, God himself expands and becomes so many planets and so many creatures and everything. But out of ego, we attach ourselves to one of those features of the universal form and say, this is me. And that's you, and that's you. And we come into the state of duality and conflict over limited resources and envy and all types of things. But actually, this world is nothing but Sahasra Sisha Purushaha Sahasraksha Sahasapate Sabhumin Visvato Vritva Atyatista Dasangulam Purushai Vedagam Sarvam The Purusha Sukta in the Rig Veda said that the Virat Rup, the universal form of the Lord, has thousands of heads, thousands of eyes, thousands of hands. And each one of them we're claiming, no, that one's mine. Due to ego, this is my body. And the food has to go in my mouth. This chocolate is mine, not yours. <laughs> so, uh, the, the bewilderment of ego makes us identify with some aspect of the Virat Rup. Now, just as a body has parts and each part has a function, so similarly, the, in the universal uh, body, God's form, the body of the universe, so the head of that body, they are the brahmanas, the priests or the intellectuals of society. And then the, the kings and warriors, the soldiers, they're the katriyas, they're like the arms of that body. And then you have the, the mercantile class uh, who are in charge of production and farming and so on. They're the belly of the body because they're producing the food to feed the arms and the, the head. And then the labor class, the suitors, they're the legs because by their labor everything goes along in society. So there's, there are strata in Vedic society that people today call the caste, the evil, horrible, terrible caste system. Right? So it's, it's not really like that. So there's a misrepresentation. And also, the, the, if one took birth in a particular caste, then that wasn't the, the deciding factor. The deciding factor of which role you play in the social system, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, mm -hmm. that uh, I've created this strata among human society and it's based on your guna and karma, the way that you behave and the qualities, psychological qualities that you have. So, 
um, uh, a Brahmin, when someone was born, would do their ho the horoscope of the person, and sometimes later in life as well, and, and see, well, what's the perfect occupation which exactly fits with that person's personality where he'll be happy? Because if you're forced to do an activity in society that is not really your nature, you undergo a great deal of stress. So everyone feels at home, someone really likes farming, someone's more of an academic, someone's more protective and, and so on. Someone's more of an artist and they like arts and crafts and music. So they would be in the, in the sudras, actually. Hmm? Um, the, that's the, the lowest caste. And that so, so-called lowest caste, or the legs of the society. So um, what happens is that when a, a, in an enlightened spiritual society, then each soul takes his birth and sees, well, according to my karma, I've got this particular body. Now, where is my body in the universal body? Have I been born in a, 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 a gross body and psychological body, which is situated within the head of the universal form, or in the arms, or in the stomach, or the legs? Huh? And then that person accepts that and does their duty. In other words, they are, by doing the duty related to the body and the, the personality that they have, they're contributing to the overall harmony and progress of the universe. Hmm? So what people think is the evil, horrible uh, caste system, which is completely oppressive and everything, that's a, a misrepresentation of the actual Vedic idea, which is more about, um, instead of popping out into the world and saying, I'm going to make this world the way I want it to be, but rather seeing the universe as it is, Mm -hmm. and then accepting that and then acting in harmony with all the parts together. And so when each person, whether in part of the head or the arms or the stomach or the legs, acts according to their duty, it's not that one is higher than another, but each one is perfectly performing their function in relation to the totality. And so they're equal. They're completely equal. It's equal opportunity to be purified and equal opportunity to contribute to the harmonic uh, development of the universe. So it's actually something quite wonderful. So those concepts are the predominant story in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. And the last six chapters are more about Gyan. And Jnana Yoga, so we've touched about Karma Yoga. Hmm? You find out where you are, you do your duty, and at the end of the day you say, God, I just did this for you, it wasn't, I don't want anything back from this. Karma Yoga. Beautiful. Huh? So your situation, your responsibilities don't have to be an obstacle. They can be a stepping stone for you. Okay, now, Jnana Yoga, last six chapters, many topics are discussed, but mainly Jnana. Jnana is, Jnana Yoga is the path of philosophical discrimination. Mm -hmm. deliberating upon the components of the world, the elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, and their subcomponents, the tan matras, shabda, uh, sparsha, um, rupa, uh, rasaganda, sound, touch, uh, form, taste and smell, the elements of the senses. Our senses are specific elements in the Vedic uh, cosmology. Uh, the buddhi, Intelligence is a subtle psychological element. Manas, the mind, is an element. Ego is an element. So analyzing all these elements, how they develop one from each other, and how, what guna they're in, those elements which are more, more tamasic, the elements which are more rajasic, passionate, and those which are more sattvic, light and clear, and developing this discrimination so that we can look upon the world as the perspective of essentially just these elef uh, elements are mixed together and they're all dancing according to the, the time is moving the elements. And so instead of seeing, um, well, let's give an example. If you watch a TV, so you, you can see a program, whatever you watch, like no one watches Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> right? None of you have ever seen a single episode, I know. <laughs> I haven't, I can be honest. I <laughs> don't even have a phone, <laughs> let alone a TV. So, but let's say you're, you're watching something on TV, right, and you become absorbed in that. There's a whole drama, got, there's a hero and there's a heroine, and there's a cliffhanging situation, and then the hero's injured and he dies, and then you're crying, and then you find out he wasn't really dead, and he gets resurrected or whatever. 
like this and you're happy again. So you're going through all of these emotions, right? But what you're actually doing, you're seeing three primary colors, hmm? red, green and yellow, that's the primary colors of light, not of art. Okay, so artists don't get upset, I'm talking to the scientists here. <laughs> so the three primary colors of light there, they're there in the pixels, and these pixels are flashing like this. But from a distance, it seems to make a picture, and, and, and now you're identifying with that and going through all these emotions. So what Jnana Yoga essentially does is breaks down all the pixels of reality so you can see you can get free from the drama. Right? It's just some elements moving. That's all it is. But out of ego and absorb, avesh, absorption in that, all this mm, loss and gain and victory and defeat and happiness and distress and honor and dishonor, all the things which are churning us and making a, uh, our psychological body unstable, uh, that's going on. So you, you can see there are different approaches here. One is that you just do your duty because it's your duty without attachment to the result. That's one method of attaining a mental equilibrium. And then the other one is to analyze the components of reality and so that the drama just disappears because it was, it was, a, it was a moha, it was a state of per illusion, of bewilderment, infatuation, you see. So these two aspects of yoga, karma yoga and jnana yoga, are the predominant subjects of the first uh, six chapters, of the last six, six chapters. So now you're left with the, the, the middle six chapters. So it's considered that the Bhagavad Gita is like a, a treasure chest. Hmm? So the first six, that's the bottom of the treasure chest, and the last six, that's the top of the treasure chest, and when you open it, all the jewels are inside in the middle here. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the predominant discussion in the middle six chapters is Bhakti Yoga. Of course, in the end of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives, at the very end, gives a quick summary of everything, and, and returns again to Bhakti Yoga but you'll find the most elaborate descriptions of bhakti here in these middle six chapters. So I'm just saying that to give some context to this chapter 12. So let's start with the first text. Arjuna uvacha evam satat yukta ye bhaktastvam paryupasate ye chapyaksharam abhyaktam tesham ke yoga vittamaha Arjun is asking, Te Yoga Vittamaha, who is the best knower, knower of yoga? Who knows yoga the best? Hmm? Vitta means a knower. So Yoga Vitta means one who knows yoga. Hmm? Then Yoga Vittara means who is a comparab comparably better knower of yoga. Vitta Vittara. And then Vitta Vittama. That's a superlative degree, just like we have good, better, and best. So here in Sanskrit we have vitta, vittara, and vittama. A knower, a better knower, and the super, a superlative knower. So here's the question, ke yoga vittama, who is the best knower of uh, the, the knowledge of yoga? Mm -hmm. And um, so Arjun is essentially because he's already been listening to Krishna and Krishna's described different things. So Arjun frames the question, well, you mentioned this type and you've also mentioned this type. So out of the two of them, who's the best? So the, the, the verse is saying, evam satata yukta ye bhaktas tam pariyupasate. Are, are they the best who? Uh, bhakta, they're devotees. But they're the kind of devotees, pariyupasate, who are worshipping you. Hmm? In your, that is in your beautiful uh, divine swarup. Mm. Krishna has a complexion like a fresh rain cloud. His hair is decorated with peacock feathers. He has beautiful lotus eyes. He's not made of flesh, blood, or he's a transcendental spiritual body, Satchidananda. So when he appears in this world, he's not born, but just from the transcendental realm, his body makes its appearance here. So that's called avatar. Avatar means to descend from the transcendental realm into, mm, to cross, oh, Ava means down and Tara means to cross. So to cross down from the divine realm and make a, an appearance within this physical realm in his original transcendental body. So those pari upasate, um, upasana means worship, uh, but if we look at the etymology of the Sanskrit, upa means nearby and asana means to sit down. 
So Upa Asana means sit down next to Krishna and serve him. Like person to person, face to face. So that might be done in your internal meditation or it may be done in a temple. There's a, there, here's a picture at the, top, at the top here of some deities in the temple. So you can directly serve, give flowers, decorate, sing, sing some songs for your beloved, uh, offer some food and offer prayers and so on. Very personal. And, um, and he's saying that these devotees are satata yukta. That means always connected with you. At every moment. They never forget you for a moment. In one way or another, they're expressing devotion with every breath of their life. Satata yukta. Hmm? And um, he's using the word evam. Evam in Sanskrit means like this. And it's, it's, it's really a reference to, to an earlier... Uh, uh, Description. Sri Krishna said earlier, Maya Saktamana Pata Yogam Yunjan Madasraya. In chapter 7, Krishna said, Hey Arjun, with your mind absorbed in me, engaging your body in service to me alone, being established in a loving relationship with me, you will come to know me in my complete form without any doubt. So, Maya Saktamana Pata. Arjun, with your mind deeply attached to me. So, Krishna said that in chapter 7. So, when Arjun begins this chapter by saying, Evam, in this way, he's actually referring to that earlier description. So, that's the first type among the candidates for who's the best yogi. And the second type, Arjun saying, is he the best or is this one the best? Ye chapya aksharam avyaktam. Hmm? That means uh, those who worship Paryupasate, they are worshipping Aksharam. Aksha means the, the word Chara means to gradually diminish. So that which is Akshara is inexhaustible, inexhaustible, undiminishing, imperishable. And Avyakta, Vyakta means personal. Vyakti, the word Vyakti means a personality. So, so Avyakti means impersonal, or Avyakta can mean um, not manifest. So it doesn't necessarily mean impersonal, it means something that could be personal, but it's not manifest to your perception. So it's Avyakta to you. It's experienced as impersonal to you because you can't perceive it. So there are different um, interpretations of that, and we want to look. We'll look at historically how different saints and sages throughout the ages have interpreted this verse. And then you can decide which interpretation you feel, you feel is most uh, valid. And uh, in many ways, many of them are valid, but some are more, just more salient, uh, if you consider them for in a impo from an impartial perspective. So, the question again. Oh, Krishna! Who is the best knower of yoga? Those who worship and love you, your devotees who have a very personal loving relationship with you, or those who worship the avyakta, the unmanifest, imperishable truth. <coughs> who is the best? Now, One of the common interpretations of this verse is that obviously there's a personal path of devotion and then there's the, the impersonal path where one believes that the ultimate truth is the Brahman, just light, an empty light. And so it seems that Arjun is asking that question. Is it better to follow the path of devotion or is it better to follow the path where I'm not an individual, you're not an individual, all individuality, all variety is simply a complete illusion and we have to rise above that and just Om, and mix it with the Brahman into the light. It seems to be that question and some uh, scholars have interpreted it in that way. Hmm? So I want to look at that perspective. But later we'll show that that's not really the question. It's not really actually the question. And, and the reason we can say that it's not actually the question is because Arjun is, is raising a question based on things that Krishna's earlier said. And Krishna didn't give the um, 
impersonal conception of reality as an option earlier in the Gita. He never gave that as an option. So Arjun wouldn't say, well, earlier you said this and you said this, well, which one's the best? Because it was actually never an option in the Gita at any point. Uh, and we'll, so we'll address that very specifically with, with, with um, the, the important passages from the Gita. But first, let's just suppose, as some saints have done, that this question is saying, what's the best path, the personalist devotional path, or the impersonal path of just letting go of everything and, 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 and losing your individuality eternally. So, among these two options, we have a situation where the conclusion of Vedanta is that, that God has created the world because the Vedanta being is Janma Dhyasya Yata, from whom the world has come. So because Brahma, Brahman, the greatest thing, this word Brahma uh, is used in Sanskrit. It means Brinhati Brinhayati Iti Brahma, who is great and makes others great, is Brahma. And Brahma, the greatest thing, the ground of being, the supreme truth. Brahma means great in the sense of that which does not admit any limitation. And so we cannot approach that Brahma, the greatest truth, the highest thing, by imposing any limitation upon it at all. So generally what people think is that the ultimate being can't have a spiritual body because in our experience, uh, having a form is a limitation. You're limited by particular dimensions. And if you have a form, you're there and you're not there. But the truth is all-pervading. Uh, so we, we, we're in this because the material mind thinks according to the three laws of thought. The three laws of thought are A is identical with itself. A is not B. And A cannot be A and B. In other words, the, the, law, the three laws of thought are a thing is identical with itself, it's different from things which are not itself, and there's the law of the excluded middle, it can't be both. So that's how we think, you see. So when we use that material thinking and we apply it to the subject of God, then we think God is all-pervading, but forms are only in one place. And so you can't be all-pervading and in one place because of the law of the excluded middle that my material mind always forces me to think in terms of. Huh? But Brahma is that which does not admit any limitation. And therefore, can God can have a form, and that form can be everywhere at once. But it only may be revealed to an individual in a particular place, while simultaneously the same person is revealing himself to another person somewhere else, or anywhere else. Hmm? Any person anywhere in the world is meditating so Krishna's right here with me. Because the form was actually always there, but it was avyakta, it wasn't manifest to that person. You see? So, this is the problem, and material logic and, and thinking and it cannot accommodate the true concept in, of, of this word Brahman, the greatest. Because Brahman is that which does not admit any limitation, but our thoughts are limited by these three laws of thought. Um, now, Vedanta tells us that, the, that the, the world comes from God. God has created the world. So because that which is unreal can never have a relationship with that which is real, then the world itself must ha be real. The world is real. It's just temporary. Hmm? It's, it's, it's unreal in the sense that it's not what we think it is because it's the Virat Rupa of God and we're thinking, well, I'm this body and you're that body and all these things in this world are for us to um, exploit and, and experience and taste or whatever. So we, have, we, have an, we mistake it. We have a mistaken understanding of the world. That's illusion. But it's not that the world is not real. Just like a, if a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat, the hat's real and the rabbit's real. He didn't really pull it out of the hat. It was, you know, in a, in a little rabbit box underneath the table somewhere, and there's a hole in the table, and he put the hat over the hole, and he, he, did, that's, he did something like that. So, so the things that we're seeing are real, but it's our interpretation of it which is illusory, you see. So, but there are some persons who say that the Supreme Truth is Brahman, only a light, impersonal light, and only that is real, and so the material world is not real at all. The world itself is completely an illusion. So they give an example, the classic example. This philosophy was um, famously 
propounded in the 8th century by Shankaracharya, 788 to 820 AD. And um, it's called uh, Mayavad or Advaitavad, Kaval Advaitavad, Advaita Vedanta. So basically what he said is that the world is completely unreal and, and thinking that the world is real is a vivarta. It's a, it, that's a vivarta illusion, it's a brahm, it's a mistake. And it's just like this. Let's say that you're in a darkened room, uh, sorry, in a darkened place in a forest and there's a tree and there's a rope hanging from the tree. But in the dark you look at the rope and think it's a snake and you feel fear. So that snake that you see isn't there. It's just, I mean, it's in your consciousness, it's in your mind, but it's a complete Brahm, it's a complete illusion. So Shankar's theory, or the impersonist theory, is that the world does not exist. It's a complete mistake. It's Vivarta, it's Brahm, it's a bewilderment. And enlightenment entails realizing that the world doesn't exist. It's Shunya, it's empty. There's nothing meaningful there. And, uh, and you're not a person and anyone else isn't a person. There's just Brahman. The light. And that's it. So that's the first idea. Um, so, you have to decide, do you believe that the world exists or it doesn't exist? So if you believe that the world has reality, in Western philosophy to think that the world is, doesn't exist, that what your senses are seeing is not really there, is called uh, the cynical, <laughs> cynical philosophy. Right? Like René Descartes. Descartes said, well, how do we know that anything is real? Maybe I'm dreaming, or maybe there's a big demon somewhere who knows magic and hypnotism, and he's hypnotized us to make us feel as if we're in his matrix. Like that. So, so René Descartes said, well, in the end, we can't prove that anything's real. Only I think, therefore I am. I know that I'm real. Uh, but the world, well... And because he was a Christian, so he said, well, I believe that the world is real because God wouldn't cheat us all. Like that, so he gave that. So, but basically, those who are on this path of Advaita Vedanta, they're com in a level of complete cynicism. Mm. And uh, Madhyamic Buddhism is also practically the same as Advaita Vedanta. Okay. So, the world is, is not real, it's a complete uh, bewilderment, illusion. Only Brahman exists. Now, if we take that position, mm, no, let me go the other way. Let's say that the world is real. You believe that the world is real. Then, everything has a cause. All things in the world are moving. And they're being moved by something else. And that's being moved by something else. And at the end of that series of cause and effects, there must be a prime mover. Otherwise, nothing would move. Everything would be frozen. At the end of that chain of cause, there must be a prime mover. So, Christians and... Aristotle, Socrates, uh, uh, they gave this argument that there must be a ground of being who's behind the first mover of everything. And, and if you consider that, what is the nature of that first mover? It must be a person. Because if it were something impersonal, then that which has no personality, has no desire. So there would be no reason to do anything. So, if you think that the world is real, then it must be admitted that God is a person. Otherwise, if there were only just some mm, impersonal kind of uh, energy, then the energy being a person would have no desire. And desire always precedes activity. No one acts without wanting something, to achieve something or do something. So, you have Gyan, Icha, Kriya. Knowledge first. Some, and if someone desires, then they must be conscious. You see? So in Sanskrit it's called Gyan, Icha, Kriya. Activity is always preceded by desire. And desire is always preceded by knowledge. So God must have knowledge. He must be a conscious person. And he ha must have desire. And therefore he can act. And therefore there's a world. And therefore God is a person. So if you accept the world is real, God's a person. And that's great. That's wonderful. Because we can deal with a person. First we can say, Oh God, I don't know who you are, but I want to serve you, I want to love you. And uh, if we, when we adopt that position, then gradually when uh, that Supreme Being is satisfied that our devotion is unmotivated, 
that we don't have any hidden agendas. So I said, well, I prayed to God and I didn't answer. All right, but what did you pray for? Did you pray for something for you or for him? Huh? So when, when our devotion it has personal, a personal agenda, then there's no reciprocation because the transcendental realm is uh, a realm of pure love, complete selflessness. So devotion has to be, it's called in Sanskrit, Tatsuka Sukibhav, the mood, I'm happy when you're happy. I just want to please you. And that's my happiness. So pure bhakti is like that. So unless we have pure bhakti, then there will not be an answer. So, so there's, the, the, there's the personal and devotional sphere. Now let's come back to the idea that the world is a complete illusion. So if one has that position, the world is a complete illusion, then there are four questions that we have to ask. And that is this. That if Brahman, the light, the ultimate truth, Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma, the Vedas say, Satyam means eternal truth. Jnanam, knowledge, anandam, bliss, Brahma. Satyam Jnanam, anantam, endless. Brahma is the nature of unlimited, eternal, endless bliss and knowledge. So if only Brahman exists, then the first question is, who is confused? If you say the world's an illusion, we're in illusion, we're confused. Well, who's confused? And then the only answer is, you, then you have to say, well, Brahman is confused. <laughs> and then I have to say, well, I think you're confused. <laughs> because Brahman is the eternal, endless, unlimited, perfect, blissful knowledge. And now your philosophy is that Brahman is confused. No, no, I think it's more likely that you're confused. And so that's the first question. So, so that first question is, what is the locus or the, uh, the, the location of the illusion. Where is it? So if only Brahman exists, the eternal unlimited knowledge, then the only option is that Brahman is confused, and that's impossible. Okay? So that's the first question. But let's just say that you don't get that point. Hmm? Well, maybe Brahman could be confused. So then the next question is, well, that was the locus, the location of the confusion, then the next question is then, question number two, please answer me this. And if Brahman is confused, what is Brahman confused about? Because if only Brahman exists, there's got to be something else for him to get confused about. Mm -hmm. So that's also impossible. So Brahman, again, Brahman is not confused. Maybe you're confused, but not Brahman. But let us say, Okay, yes, yes, yes. Um, do it straight away. Um, you, asked previ you said previously Brahman is, admits no limitation, is that what you said? The, the word uh, Brahman, uh, yeah, it means the greatest, so the greatest implies it admits no limitation at all. And when to, like, it was unlimited, to admit limitation, like, it could be in a body, could it admit confusion? Uh -huh. Yes, well, the point here is that uh, to admit limitation means that he can have a body and be, ad and be in, uh, in one place, but that body can also be everywhere. Um, but his satyam jnanam anantam, his gyan is unlimited. So his gyan cannot be, his gyan cannot be limited. But... If you say, well, that's a limitation, then he cannot do that. No, he can do that. But he doesn't do that personally. He does it through his, his angsa, his expansion. And that's the jiva. So can Brahman be confused? Yes. The aspect of Brahman that's confused is you. Right? But not him. But you see, that aspect is eternally an aspect. It's not, a part, it's not that a part of him has become confused. Because Brahman is indivisible. It's beyond duality and indivisible. So it's not that a part of him can be confused while another part of him isn't confused. But Brahman has, um, the Vedas say, Prasha Shakti Vividhaya Vashurite, which means Brahman has unlimited energies. And one of those energies is the Jiva. So in, 
chapter 15, Krishna says, Mamai Vang So Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatna. Every soul is a, is a soul. Every soul is one of my expanded energies. But they're eternally my expanded energy. In other words, every soul exists from time without beginning and will exist forever. So it's not that they once came out of Brahman and then will mix back in with him. But Brahman was always Brahman and Jiva was always Jiva. So Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. The Bhuta, the existence of the living entity is eternal. Mm -hmm. Because that which is spiritual is beyond time. So it doesn't change its state. It doesn't change its state. So, now, the first question, who is confused? Brahma is not confused. On a higher level, you can say, can Brahman be confused? He can have transcendental confusion. <laughs> hmm? But that's a topic way beyond this metaphysics. When you come into Krishna, not in the Gita, but Krishna in his Leela. Hmm? For example, Krishna's girlfriend Radharani. Hmm? Sometimes she gets upset with him and she gets really confused over that. Huh? When Krishna is dancing with the gopis in the Rasalila, actually all, each and every one of these gopis is actually Radha in a different form. But he's confused about that. He thinks they're different gopis, you see. So, the confusion can be in God, but that is a transcendental confusion that augments the relishment of Rasa, the relishment of Prem, the relishment of love. You see. So the Brahman is never touched by Maya illusion. So, now, so the first question, one who is confused? Brahman cannot be materially confused. Two, who is, what is the object, what is the thing that's making Brahman confused? Because there's nothing exists. Now, we're not saying that nothing exists other than Brahman. We're saying that God has Shaktis, but if you start with that basic idea, only Brahman exists, then the onus is on you to say, what is the thing that's causing Brahman to be confused? Mm -hmm. Then, the third thing is, third question is, that to be confused, to be in illusion about something, let's take the example of the rope and the snake. You can only mistake a rope for a snake if you have prior experience of a snake. Right? If you have a memory of what a snake is like, then you could mistake the rope for a snake and it could surprise you. So if, first of all, only Brahman exists and there's no variety there whatsoever, first he can be confused, secondly there's nothing he can be confused about, but if we accepted miracle of miracles, hypothetically and illogically speaking, that he could be confused and there would be something he could be confused about, he'd have to have a prior knowledge of something to be confused about whatever he's seeing as well, which is, uh, not a pos which is not possible, and this is the reason why it's not possible. So our third question all uh, is based on the impossibility of similarity. And that is this, you mistake a rope for a snake because there's, there's some similarity between them. But if you're seeing, you're looking and seeing Brahman, but by mistake you're, you're seeing this world. What's the similarity between North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Raleigh Durham, and the endless impersonal non-differentiated light of Brahman? They'd have to be similar to mistake Brahman for the world. And there's no similarity. In fact, that which is near Gun, near Vishesh, having no qualities, and no characteristics can't be mistaken for anything because it has no similarity to anything at all. Hmm? So, so the third point is that for who's, who's in mis ha ha is confused? What are they confused about? And what's the possibility, the third point, how is the possibility of mistaking Brahman for the world, which is the essential illusion we're talking about, when there's no similarity between them? Hmm? Mm -hmm. And then the fourth point is, the fourth question we have to ask to our dear mm, Kevala Advaita Vedanta Vadi brothers and sisters, is that 
if it were, pos it were possible, step one were possible, which it isn't, step two were possible, which it isn't, and step three were possible, let's admit that there's some similarity between complete emptiness and complete variety, and so you could mistake the two. Then, just as a person could mistake Brahman for the world and being illusion, when things are similar, you can make the mistake the other way around. Right? For example, you could see a snake hanging from the tree in the dark and say, oh, there's my rope. I wondered where I put it and, gra and grab the snake. <laughs> You'd be in for an unpleasant surprise. Uh, like that. So when you can mistake one thing from another, it goes both ways. So just as some, by some inexplicable way, Brahman mistook Brahman for the world and is now in illusion, then that would mean that you'd have, you'd have people just randomly becoming enlightened by mistake. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what would happen. People just randomly become enlightened by mistake. Yeah. They'd just be walking down the street and see, oh, there's my Honda SUV. So, Wait a minute, that's not a Honda SUV. That's Brahman. I've become enlightened. <laughs> I just mistaken, I mistook Brahman for Trader Joe's <laughs> or for my dog or whatever it is. Eh? So if the variety of the world eh, who are similar to Brahman so that you can mistake it this way, then you should be, be able to mistake it the other way as well. So in this way, just through four simple questions, the impersonal conception is deconstructed entirely. Okay, so now let's see. Arjuna has asked this question, what's the best path? The path of bhakti, loving devotion to a personal God, or the worship of this aksharam, indestructible avyakta, unmanifest something? Now, Krishna gives the answer. And he said, It would be nice to speak for a week on the first verse as well, actually. There's, there's so many interesting things in this, but we have to move on. Um, Krishna gives the answer. He says, Maya Vesha Mano Ye Mam Nitya Yukta Upasate Sradhya Paryupetas Te Me Yukta Mata I consider that those who absorb their minds in me, in my personal form, constantly desiring to associate with me, and who with firm faith Sraddhaya, Paryupasate, with firm faith they worship me, they are the quickest to attain me. They attain me the quickest. But those, Yetu Aksharam Anirdesyam, those who worship the unmanifest, the, the indestructible, uh, the inconceivable, the indescribable, um, and who see everyone equally, and uh, they act for the welfare of everyone, they also eventually attain me, Krishna says. They also eventually attain me. But, so Arjuna asked two paths, and Krishna said, the personal path is the best, and it's very fast, and the other path is possible, and in the end you'll come to me as well. But that has to be qualified somewhat. So now Krishna is going to qualify. He says, avyakta sakta sam, which means those whose chitta consciousness is avyakta asakta, attached to the impersonal mm, conception of reality, then klesha adhikaratastesham. You know what klesh means, right? You're all yogis. What does klesh mean? <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, the, the sources of suffering. Klesh are the sources of suffering. And adhikar means um, eligible. In other words, those who walk the impersonal path are er eligible for a great deal of suffering. It's extremely difficult. Because for, for thousands of lifetimes, we are conditioned to think in personal ways. And so to try to just overcome that, and go into some impersonal space, okay, you can do it for five minutes, but you'll soon come out and want to, whatever, cut the grass or do something productive. Uh, so, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult path. It's very time-consuming. It takes a, um, it, it, it's a great struggle because it goes against one's conditioning. Whereas the devotional path is not only superior, 
but it actually makes the best use of your conditioning whereby you become purified. So, actually in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Krishna said, Kaivalyam satvakam jnanam Rajo vaikaupitam chayat Prakritam tamasam jnanam man nishtam nirgunam smritam It means that knowledge in the mode of ignorance, tamagun, is just knowledge of gross physical things. You know, how to fix a car, how to build a house, how to just get things and do things. That's knowledge in the mode of ignorance. Then, uh, Rajo Vaikalpitam Chayat. The Rajas is uh, the mode of passion causes one to think in terms of polarities, polarities and priorities. It, it looks into things and finds differences, polarities between things, and then prioritizes one and marginalizes another, and in this way, that's how we analyze the world and, and structure our thoughts and concepts. So that type of analytical knowledge comes from rajas. So when the mind dies down, then kaivalyam satukam jnanam. That when one comes in the mode of goodness, sattvagun, then you see that beyond all the dualities, there's, there's a certain oneness, kaivalya. And therefore, those who try to cultivate the mode of goodness, but they're not following a bhakti path, they automatically, because that's the nature of the mind, come to a, the kind of impersonal conclusion about things. Because that's the type of experience you get from sattva gun. But remember, tamas, rajas and sattva, they're all maya. They're all maya. So this conception of oneness is also a mayic impression. One at Raj Tamagun makes you not think about anything. Rajagun puts you into these dualities and Satvagun makes you flip into oneness mode. But it's all Maya. It's all illusion. So then, Manishtam Nirgunam Smritam. But Krishna said, when your mind is absorbed in me, that is Nirgun. That's beyond the Gunas. So the, there is material variety which is illusory, temporary, and there's transcendental variety. So because we're accustomed, accustomed to think about variety, we just have to shift the subject of our thoughts from the material variety to the transcendental variety through hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, serving the deity, hearing his words, studying Gita, Bhagavatam and so on, like this. So bhakti is very natural and it also takes you beyond tamas, beyond rajas and even stops you from getting stuck in that sattvic dead end. Because once you... Uh, give up on any type of variety, then there's no way out. There's no way out anymore. So it's sometimes compared to being haunted by a ghost, that once a ghost kind of takes over your mind, then uh, all your thoughts everything are under his control, so you never get free. An uh, exorcist will have to come and, and cast it away. So um, Now, so Krishna said, that path, the impersonal path, uh, you, you, you struggle a lot, you have to suffer a lot, it takes a long time. He said, but in the end you attain me. So, the Acharyas are commenting on this when he said, in the end you attain me, it doesn't mean that they attain the personal form of him. They attain the light which is emanating. The Brahman is just the aura coming from the personal body of God. Vedanti tat tattva vidas tattvam yad jnanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti shabjate Bhagavan the person is the foundational truth and his expansion paramatma is in every atom manifesting the universe and then the light emanating from his form is, is that uh, impersonal Brahman. So in Bhagavad Gita you also see in chapter 7 Brahmano hi patistaham I am the basis of the light of Brahman. Uh, so um, Krishna is not saying that both paths lead to the same goal. Now you may remember that, that the idea that this is one choice was to follow the personal path of bhakti and the other is to follow the impersonal path was predicated on understanding the word of Vyakta in the question to mean impersonal Brahman. And we mentioned early that actually that's really not what Krishna is speaking about. Here. That's not what Arjuna is speaking about here. Even though that's very often the discussion that goes on. So the, the, the actual meaning is this, that in, in chapter 2, See, Krishna speaks about knowledge of the soul. And he says, 
um, avyakto yam, achinto yam, the soul is avyakta. And it's inconceivable. So when Arjun asks this question, is it better to serve you uh, in, in your personal form or meditate on the avyakta, the impersonal, he's not making uh, the, he's not giving an option to even follow the impersonal path. What he's actually saying is, should I serve you right now in my state of, of ignorance? Or should I try to realize avyakta my soul first and then serve you? That's the question. Is that clear to everyone? If, if you didn't quite catch it, I'll just state it again. Who'd like to hear that again? Huh? Is it? The actual question is, because in, in chapter 2, see, uh, Krishna describes, he, he does a lot of discussion about the soul. He says, That as the, uh, just as in your life you change your body, you're a child, then you're an adult, then you go into old age. And then you get another body. So in the same way, the soul is actually, there's a soul in that body. And the bodies are changing. And it's just the soul changing body. So when you die, it's nothing new. Because you've already changed your body in your life. So don't be worried about death. Right? right? Where's that baby body you used to have that your mother used to breastfeed? Right? It's gone. Are you, did, did that scare you? <laughs> that you changed your body. So don't be scared of death. It's just a change of body. You've done it before you remember it. Uh, not that you remember death, but you, you remember changing your body in this life. And death's just like, it's just a smooth transition to the next episode of your, of your karma. It's your aparabdha karma coming. So, and then Krishna describes how uh, the soul cannot be cut by a, a sword. It cannot be burnt by fire. It cannot be withered by the wind. He says, just as a person, when their clothes get old, they throw them away and buy some new clothes. So in the same way, the soul is changing his body. Uh, the soul is a, is a particle of spiritual light, which is, is indestructible and avyakta. It's unmanifest and so on. So these words that Arjun uses here in the question, it's not a choice between, do we follow the personal path of bhakti or do we follow this impersonal path? Uh, he's saying avyak, avyakta, akshara. He's saying... Should an ordinary person who doesn't really know anything go straight into bhakti? Or should they try to follow this path of jnana and discrimination and meditate and control the mind and actually realize I'm not this body, I'm the soul, I'm the avyakta, I'm the akshara. And then when their obstacles, their material obstacles which are holding them back, the lust, anger and greed, they've conquered them all, then they should serve you. As Krishna mentions in Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatmana Sochati Nakankshati Samaksarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. A person who performs his duty without attachment gradually realizes his soul and becomes happy. He never hankers for anything, he never laments for anything, he sees everyone equally, and then after that he takes up Bhakti. Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. So that's what Arjuna said. What's the best thing to do? Just where you are right now. With all your ignorance and faults and everything, just have kirtan and serve Krishna and do bhakti and be happy. And so will you become enlightened automatically like that, even though you're not enlightened at the moment? Or should you do this meditation and separate the, the, the material components from your spiritual being, become really established beyond your ego and do bhakti later? That's actually the question of chapter, the beginning of chapter 12 of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah? Everyone's got it? Okay, so, so that now Krishna, Krishna is giving the answer uh, that actually, no, just do bhakti right now. Because the, the side effect of doing bhakti is all knowledge comes automatically. Mm -hmm. And the other path, it's going to be very difficult. And in the end, you have to do bhakti anyway once you realize the self. So what, you have the situation where the soul in Gita is called anksa. A, 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 that means a tiny particle, spiritual particle of God. And, and so the, 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 the particle related to its source, the source is called Amsi. Angsi is the source and Angsa is the part. <laughs> so the, the question is, there are two paths here. Does the Angsa learn from his guru, hey, you're a part of God, so you should serve him, and he just does that? Or should the Angsa realize his Angsa first, fully, and then serve the Angsi? Those are the two options that... 
um, Arjun is asking about, and we know that this is a fact. If you're if you study literature, we're doing textual criticism here, and th that must be the interpretation of the question because the impersonal idea was never on the table anywhere in the discussion. And you see, every every time in Gita when Arjun asks a question, it's always about well, you said this and you said this, and which one's the best? Or I can't reconcile this with this that you said. How do you reconcile it? So uh, each. Every uh, word of Gita should be seen in the context of the whole conversation. Um, so then, of course, Krishna gives the answer that just take to the personal path straight away, that's the best thing for you, and it will be very fast. Why? Now Krishna will go on to say, after saying that those who try to be situated in the Atma first and then do Bhakti, it's very troublesome. Uh, now Krishna said in chapter in verse seven, "Teshamaham samud artha mrtya sangsara sagarat bhavami nacharat pata maya vestita cheta sam." But for those who have surrendered to me, given up all activities in order to attain me, and they m worship me in ananya, Krishna saying ananya evena, ananya yogena, one-pointed bhakti exclusive devotion, not mixed with karma, jnana, or ashtanga yoga. He said, it's very beautiful words, he said, samsara sagarat, means from the ocean of birth and death. Hmm? Tesham aham samudharta na chirat. Very quickly, I become the deliverer of that soul from the ocean of birth and death. That means that when that person Let's say that person is chanting and they're worshipping Lord Narayan, God in the forearm form of Lord Narayan. They're chanting the holy names and they become absorbed and they go in Samadhi. Then that person will see Garuda flying with Lord Narayan riding on his back and reach out and catch him by the hand and say, come with me and take him to the spiritual world. And not when he dies, even in his, this life he'll experience that in his meditation. So his physical body will still be here and now that person becomes a guru because he's already enlightened, he's already attained the transcendental realm, and he can teach others how to live life in such a way that Lord Narayan flying on the back of Garuda will come and take you out of the ocean of birth and death. That's what Krishna's saying. And of course, for those who are more attracted to Krishna in his sweet and human-like feature, then there's no opulence. They, they, they don't have that experience. But rather, as they go into trance, they experience a form as a beautiful gopi of Vrindavan and Krishna will play his flute and call you to dance with him in the Rasalila. So, this class today was advertised, I see the poster of it, it's called the evolution of consciousness. So I want to just now move on from this um, dialectic between the personal and the impersonal and so on and, and move on to the midsection of chapter 12 um, where, let's just look at a, a few verses here, verse 8, oh, we're coming directly, we just discussed 7, we're coming to 8, 9, 10, 11, and so on. Krishna said, hey Arjun, and you should think that he's not speaking to Arjun, you should think that Supreme Lord mm, is speaking directly to you. You see, everyone has some love. Right? We all love something, we all have attachment to something. But the reason we're attached to it is because of the relation it has with our body. For example, you love your children, they're your bodily products. You, you, you um, prioritize them over, say, someone else's children whom you don't know, right? because of the connection with the body. And for example, if you were to die and your soul will leave, now you'll love the family that's connected with that body and you totally forget about the others. So the basis of affection in this world is the physical body, actually, because it ends at once. As soon as you leave, you just become attached somewhere else that that body is related to, you see. So, but why do we love our body? Because our soul is in it. Huh? When you die and you leave this body, then this body will rot and you never think about it ever again. You love the new body you get into. So we love things because of the connection of the body. We love the body because of the connection of the soul. 
But within the soul, the soul of our soul, Paramatma, there is God. So the reason we love ourself is because we're part of God. So the true object of love that is called in Sanskrit, the technical term, it's called Premaspada. Aspada means the, 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 the place, uh, the location of love, the true location where love should be placed is the soul of our soul. That is Krishna. So, Krishna is saying, Hey Arjun, and not only Arjun, hmm? what's your name? Irina. Irina. So Krishna says, Hey Irina, <laughs> concentrate your mind only on me. Fix your intelligence fully on me. And you will, without a doubt, dwell very close to me. When you give up this life, you'll come to me. And then Krishna said, otherwise, if you're not able, now to come to text 9, atachitam samadhatum, if you're not able to concentrate your mind on me steadily, then seek to attain me by the method of withdrawing the mind from sense objects and fixing it on me. Hmm? So the difference here is, in the first stage, a person is just due to association of their guru and blessing of their guru, they just naturally wandering around in life, oh, Krishna, I love you. And they're just naturally like that all the time. So Krishna said, look, if you can't be like that, if you haven't had that kind of grace of guru yet, that your heart is just flowing Krishna, Krishna, and day and night you're just in love with Krishna, then he said, okay, then practice in such a way. Withdraw your mind from the external things and focus on me through hearing, chanting, remembering the various limbs of bhakti. And then he said, so... Um, and then in the next verse, text 10, Krishna said, and if you're unable to practice like that, then just do activities for me. And take that as a goal of your life. Perform activities for my pleasure, and you'll attain, eventually you'll attain me. And then, in the next verse, text 11, Krishna said, and if you can't do that, you see, Krishna's so nice. He's not pushy. He's like, try this. Is that too hard for you? Okay, just do this. Are you struggling with that? Okay, just do this little, little thing. <laughs> He's so kind. He's, he has such empathy for us. He's so sympathetic to our problems and difficulties. He said, okay, if you can just work and do things for me, then what you should do is, if you cannot do this, then you should attack that Apyasakto kartad madhyogam ashutam. says, take shelter of my protective method. And protective method is the duties of life. So in, in the Vedic culture, then your duty is when you're young, you're a celibate student, brahmachari. Then after that you get married and you have a family. You take care of your wife and children. And uh, uh, you uh, perform a fire sacrifice on every full moon. And there are some duties, that religious duties you do and social duties that you do. And Chris said, well, just do those duties, but think in your mind you're doing them for me. And don't try to in enjoy the results of, of that activity. So here we have the subject today, the, the um, evolution of consciousness. So the first stage is a person who, they're very much entangled in the world. Maybe they have a lot of responsibilities and they don't have a lot of time off. So Krishna said, okay, I've got a prescription for you. And this is it. Do your duties really nicely, best you can. Be ideal in your role as a father or a mother or a son or a brother or the local mayor or whatever you, whatever you do. Hmm? The local yoga teacher. Hey? <laughs> and you do that really nice, really nicely. Huh? And at the end of the day, you think, Krishna, I try to do this in the most exemplary way as an offering in your glory, to glorify you. Uh, and gradually, gradually, uh, the, the uh, identification with the body will fall away, for sure. And understanding of the self will come, and slowly some, the devotional inclination will come. So then the next level of person, they've got more time on their hands. Krishna is saying here, that, that's not the person of do your duty for me. This is just do work for me. In other words, 
you don't ha you have more time on your hands you're not entangled in all of these duties so directly do stuff for me for example um, build a temple right so there may be a person who has some duties in their life but they've got a lot of spare time so they decide well let me collect some money from here and there get a piece of land let's talk to an architect make a plan and build a temple and they, they try to use their time in doing something practical for Krishna. So it's working for Krishna. Um, let's make a, a garden. And I'll water the flowers every day. And I'll pick them and make some garlands. And I'll bring them to someone else's temple. And offer them to the deities of Krishna there. So working. Krishna said, okay. Uh, if you've got time, work for me. Slowly, slowly, knowledge will start to appear. And uh, the devotional inclination will become stronger. Then you have the persons who, well, they are, um, their minds are somewhat more peaceful and they can actually sit down in one place and, and, and meditate. Take the japa mala and remember the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 And these things are not exclusive. Let's say you're really busy. You could do some of that as well. Just do that for 10 minutes while you're really busy. And at the end of the day, offer your, your work to God. And then if you've got more time, build a temple, grow some flowers, grow some vegetables, and offer them to Krishna at the temple and so on like that. But you should also chant maybe. You can chant a bit more. And then there are those persons whose consciousness has evolved more. And they're, they're just, I'm not doing any karma. Forget it, I'm not doing any karma. Never. Hold a gun to my head. Even when Brahma, Lord Shiva could appear and say, do some karma. No, nope, I'm not doing it. <laughs> not doing it. Because I know, I know, I'm not this body. I'm not this body. So why should I act in terms of this physical body? My karmic duties, and I'm a soul, I'm going to act like a soul right now. And that's all I'm going to do. Hmm? So those types of devotees are quite rare, but they exist. Those whose whole life, 24 hours a day, hearing, chanting, remembering, studying, teaching, everything. Like my Guru did my whole parampara. So those are very great. And th those who follow that path, then they come to the first option that Krishna gave. And that is psh, to be totally absorbed. So, um, because this is a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, let's just have a look at a few examples. The relationship between Krishna and Arjuna. It's a very fascinating relationship. Um, Arjuna is an eternal associate of Krishna. He's not a human being like us. He's actually, he lives in the spiritual world of Krishna. When Krishna comes, he also comes. And, um, and performs pastimes with Krishna. But part of his pastime is he behaves like us and sometimes gets confused and Krishna enlightens him. So it's like a drama, basically, to teach others. Uh, but he really does become covered over by Krishna's will in order to have this exchange with Krishna. So, once it happened that Arjun was wondering mm, with his bow, he's, he's a famous bowman, he was wandering on the bank of a river. And he came and he saw this big, old monkey was there. And Arjun said, excuse me, sir, who are you? And that big old monkey got up said, my name is Hanuman, Ram Das, the servant of Ram. And God is one, but God has many forms. And the original form is Krishna, all the other forms come from him, but they're Krishna playing different forms. But, but a devotee only loves one form. That's called the Ishta Dev. They're fixed on one form. Because love can't be. Real love that's strong has possessiveness for an individual. So, so Hanuman said, I am Ram Das, the servant of Ram, Hanuman. Now, as you know, Lord Ram is also a bowman. He's famous for his archery. And Arjun is also famous for his archery. And then, so Arjun being so much proud of his archery, he said, oh, the servant of that Ram. You mean that Ram who could not make a bridge from arrows? to go to Lanka. And so I had to employ so many monkeys bringing stones and making a bridge across the ocean. Uh -huh. Arjun said, if I had been there at that time, I would have just
taken my quiver of arrows, chanted some mantras, and, and made a bridge of arrows, and everyone could have marched across it. I would have done it in a moment. And the man said, hmm, really? He said, that may be true. That may be true. However, your bridge would not have been capable of withstanding the weight of even one of us monkeys. So what would be the point of that? So now, first, the Hanuman's pride was triggered a little bit by Arjun's words. Now Arjun's pride has been triggered a bit by Hanuman's words. So then, then Arjun said to Hanuman, All right, let's see. I'll make a bridge of arrows right now across this river. And you can see how strong it is. So then Arjun took his quiver of arrows, chanted mantra, like this. And in a moment he made a beautiful bridge of arrows, like San Francisco, Golden Deck Gate Bridge, yeah, but made of arrows, right across the river. Uh -huh. So then Hanuman looked at it, he thought, it looks like quite a pretty sturdy bridge. So Hanuman said, I'll be right back. <laughs> Hanuman quickly flew to the Himalayas. He got thousands of mountain tops and he tied them onto every hair on his body. <laughs> and then he came back in a huge form. <laughs> shaking the earth. And Arjun looked. Oh, Krishna. <laughs> So then Hanuman put one foot on the bridge, and the bridge was <laughs> creaking, and, Hanu and, and Arjun was praying, Oh Krishna, oh Krishna, please, you are famous as the lord of the Pandavas, and if my dignity is diminished by this episode, then you'll get the ill fame. So Krishna, please save your devotee's reputation. Krishna, 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 he was praying like this, as the bridge was cracking. So then Hanuman, he put his other foot on the bridge. So as Hanuman was about to put his other foot on the bridge, because he thought with one foot it would definitely break. So after putting one foot on the bridge, and it didn't break, then Hanuman was praying, Oh Lord Ram, <laughs> Lord of Hanuman, <laughs> you are famous as the Lord of Hanuman, and if I lose in this challenge, then your fame will be diminished. Please protect your own fame and the dignity of your devotee. <laughs> so now Arjun is praying, oh Krishna, and Hanuman is praying, oh Ram. And of course Ram and Krishna are the same person, they're both Bhagavan. They're not two people, it's just one person doing a different Leela. So then Hanuman, he puts his second foot onto the bridge. And just as he put it there, the bridge is it's really break, going down a little bit, but it doesn't break. And he looks down and he sees this red flowing in the river. There's some blood flowing in the river. So then Hanuman and Arjun, Hanuman jumped down Arjun and they came underneath and they looked. And Hanuman looked and saw Lord Ram was underneath the bridge holding it up on his back. And Arjun looked and saw Krishna. They were both looking at the same person. But because spiritual form is unlimited, it has no limitations. It can appear in any way to anyone at any moment in any place. So Hanuman was seeing Lord Ram holding up the bridge and Arjun was seeing Krishna was holding up the bridge. And both of them they gave obeisances like this. Huh? Because Supreme Lord loves his devotee. He protected the honor of Arjun by not letting the bridge break. And he protected the honor of Hanuman. Why? Because it was clear if he hadn't been there, the bridge would have broken. So he protected the honor of both of them. By one act. Mm. And now they were both beholding the supreme absolute truth. But according to the flavor of their own bhakti. Mm. Because in chapter 4 of Gita, Krishna said, mm. I reciprocate with everyone. So if you think the Supreme Truth in, is impersonal, no problem. You'll see the light. But that's just my effulgence. You can't go. Your, your vision doesn't penetrate through my effulgence. 
So in the Ishu Panishad, there's a prayer in Ishu Panishad. Oh my Lord, please remove your dazzling effulgence so I can see your smiling face. Hmm? So if you want to see God as all-powerful, He'll be Lord Narayan. And if you want to see Him as a hero, and a prince, and an upstanding religious person, He'll be Mariyada Purushottam Ram. And if you want to see Him as sweet, beautiful, uh, most romantic sweetheart, lover, playing a flute in the moonlit forest, him, that's his original form, Krishna. And you'll see him dancing with Radha and the gopis. And that's why God is unlimited and reciprocates with unlimited living entities mm. in unlimited different ways. It's not unlimited to just be Brahman and you all mix in with me. Boom, boom, everyone the same. Right? Everyone's just cut from the same cookie cutter and re just reciprocating. Not reciprocating, it's just the same with it. No. God is unlimited, and there are unlimited souls, and he, and, and he reciprocates unlimitedly, unlimited ways with unlimited souls. That is actually Brahma, the greatest. So then, Krishna said to Arjun and Hanuman, or Ram said to Arjun and Hanuman, depending on whose eyes you're looking through, <laughs> you are both my great devotees. You're both my great devotees. But Arjun is especially dear to me. So Hanuman, you should serve him. Because there are also degrees of praying. So Hanuman, you should serve Arjun by taking a position on his flag. So you see Bhagavad Gita always as a chariot on the front and on the flag of Arjun is Hanuman. That's not a painting. Hanuman actually became on the flag of Arjun. So when Arjun went into battle, then Hanuman would scream at the top of his voice and everyone would be terrified. The fight would be over before it even started. And that's how Hanuman serves Arjun. Because Arjun's uh, devotion is superior. Why? Because Hanuman is in Dasya Ras. There are five Rasas, relations with Krishna. The first is called Shanta. Passive adoration, when you worship the truth from afar. And then closer to that is Dasya, that means, I am your servant, you are my master. But higher than that is Sakya, friendship, where you feel equal, equality, and very close. So for example, if Lord Ram sits down on a bed, Hanuman will kneel on one knee before him. He won't come up and sit down, oh Ram, how are you doing? <laughs> right? You never see you, Hanuman's on, on one knee at the feet of Ram, I am your servant, you are my master, please instruct me what to do. That's Dasya mood. Huh? But when you see Arjun, Arjun is the warrior on the chariot, and Chris is like, yes sir, where, where can I drive you today? He's like, he's like Krishna's chauffeur. Huh? So you always see Hanuman kneeling down, but you always see Krishna serving Arjun. Why? Because the power of love. The more love allows one Praying means love. And that praying allows you to see God. But the more powerful the love is, the closer God comes to you. And the more powerful the love is, the more He's controlled, where He becomes the servant of His devotee. Mm. So that's it. The essence of Bhagavad Gita, you don't even have to open the book. It's just there on the front cover. Yeah. Krishna's driving the chariot. <coughs> means, oh Arjun, I love you so much. What do you want me to do? Where can I take you today? You're my brother. You're going to war? I'll go to war with you. Uh, 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 Krishna has no business in that battlefield. He has no business being on that battlefield. He's only there because he's controlled by the love of God. I'll come with you. I'll stand by. I'll drive for you. I'll drive your chariot. So these, these are manifestations of transcendental ecstasy. They're called anubhavs. When you feel an ecstatic emotion and it moves you, that you actually physically move. So Krishna driving the chariot of Arjun is an anubhav. The love of Arjun, he tastes it so intensely that it makes him wake up in the morning, go to the stable, get Arjun's horses and fasten them to his chariot. In other words, God has come under the control of Prem. So that's the greatest quality of the Supreme Being, Prem Avasita. He's controlled by love and Bhakta Vatsavyata that he just has intense affection for his devotees. Mm. So Arjun is so close to Krishna. They, are, they have so much fun together. You know, at, at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra, it went on for 18 days. And uh, when every day when the warriors come back to their camp, then uh, the, the 
uh, the warrior gets down first and then the chariot driver gets down. It's a sign of respect. The warrior, the prince, gets off the chariot, then the chariot driver gets down. Uh, sorry, the chariot driver gets down first and then the warrior gets down. So when the battle was over 18 days, then Krishna drove the chariot back to the camp and instead of getting down first and then helping Arjun get down, he told Arjun, just get down and go to some distance. So then Arjun, he got off the chariot, he was wondering what's going on. And he went and stood in some distance. And then Krishna stepped off the chariot. And the moment Krishna stepped off the chariot, it exploded. Arjun said, what was that? Krishna said, actually during this battle, you were hit by so many weapons, so many missiles. But because I was on the chariot, nothing happened. <laughs> and so today I told you to get off first. And when I got, got off, then the delayed reaction of the weapons that had hit the chariot, they all went off at once. And, they, and, and, and exploded, they blew up the chariot. Like that, then Arj Arjun was... <laughs> There's a lot of pastimes of that, the way, because it, it's, a, it's a funny thing. Arjun has no fault, but he's a warrior. And warriors have this, you know, they like to sit around the table and, and brag about their heroic deeds over what, mead and, you know. <laughs> and they think, you know, it's the same thing like in Western culture. If you die in battle, you go to Valhalla where all the heroes feast at the table, you know. So they have that idea as well. So that's the nature of warriors. So in Krishna's Leela, because Arjun's a warrior, he's always in that capacity of, you know, I did this and I did that. And Krishna's always cutting his pride down. Uh, it's, a it's a lot of fun. Hmm? So once it happened, that uh, actually now the, the battle was over and everything, and so the, the warriors got together, and Bhim saying, the elder brother of Arjun was saying, I destroyed single-handedly so many 60,000 warriors at once in one day. And uh, Arjun said, well, I destroyed so many, and they were doing the math, and it was impossible. <laughs> Someone was bragging. Because when you added it all up, it was, it was more people than there were on the battlefield. <laughs> so Arjun and his elder brother were kind of quarreling over who'd, who'd been the most heroic and, and, and achieved, uh, who was worthy of the most medals after this battle for each other. And so they said, well, let's ask Krishna. So then Krishna said, well, I know who can tell us. Hmm? Babarik. Now you may not know Babarik, but before the battle of Kurukshetra took place, warriors from all around the world were coming, and there was a very powerful warrior, his name was Babarik. And he's actually the grandson of Bhimsen, son of Gadakach. So Babarik came some days before the battle was taking place. And he came to Arjun and Krishna, and he said, I could single-handedly kill all the warriors on both sides, just myself. Really? He said, yeah, watch this. So he took an arrow with some mm, red dye on it, and he shot, he chanted a mantra and he shot the arrow, and the arrow went everywhere, <laughs> on all sides, and made a red mark on the heart of everyone, and, and then came back to him. He said, you see, first I marked my target. <laughs> and then he took another arrow and then he was about to cut the, shoot the other arrow and Krishna called his Sudarshan Chakra and with the Chakra he cut off the head of Babarik there and then but Krishna's Chakra is transcendental so his, his, uh, his head was still alive <laughs> and then Babarik he was really upset <laughs> and he, he wasn't so much upset that he'd been headed, he was upset that he was going to miss this great battle. You know, fighting was his thing. <laughs> fighting was his thing. And, and, he, and he said, now, no, not only can I fight, I, at least I wanted to watch. <laughs> so see, Krishna said, okay, no problem. Look, I'll just put your head at the top of this tree on the hill, <laughs> overlooking the battlefield, and you can, you can watch. Right? Live pay-per-view. Like, you, know. <laughs> you can see the big... The, this is like the biggest battle in the whole of the previous age, Dwarpa Dwar Dwar Yuga, so he was really fired up about it. So he was really happy. Krishna put his head in the tree, and he was waiting for the action to start. <laughs> so the action started, 80 days, everyone's killed. Only, the only survivors are the five Pandavas, 
and uh, Ashwatthama, Kripacharya, and Kritavarma. That's it. That's no one else survived the battle. Millions of people died in the battle. And so Arjun and and Bhim saying they they're quarrelling with each other. Krishna brings say, "Come on, let's talk to Barbarik. He saw the whole thing." So then Krishna and 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 and, and, and Bhim saying they come and they look up the tree and they, hey Barbarik, tell him the score. Now, hey, Barbaric, tell him, I, I was the most successful in this battle. Barbaric was smiling, he said, I saw everything. So, so, so who killed the most? Who killed the most? He said, well, it wasn't Arjun. Beam Sain was so happy. They said, it wasn't Beam Sain either. Then they were both confused. Then Barbaric said, I was watching and I saw Krishna killed everyone. Huh? Because on... God is doing everything. Hmm? Only out of our hunger, out of ego, we think we are doing everything. Because Krishna said in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Nimitta Matam Babasabhya Sachin. Hey Arjun, you're a great warrior. I'm not asking you to kill anyone. I'm just asking you to be an instrument for the destiny that I will unfold. Hmm? But out of ego, we forget that we're only the instruments of the, of the Supreme Lord. Hmm? And so then both... Arjun and Bhim saying they became deflated, their egos were deflated. And, yeah, actually. All credit goes to, we cannot take credit for anything. All greatness, all beauty, all achievement, that is the glory of Krishna, actually. So, Arjun and Krishna, we, people read the Bhagavad Gita, but go inside the characters a little bit. Huh? Arjun and Krishna have such a loving, loving relationship. When once Narad Muni, he was traveling throughout the universe and he, he came to visit um, Astinapur, where the pandas was, was staying. And he came and, Ar and Krishna was visiting at that time. So he arrived just after lunch. So Krishna and Arjun, they'd already eaten together and they went to take rest. And they went and they were resting on the same bed. Yeah? Only really close friends are going to lie down on this. So Krishna's head was this end and his feet were this end, and Arjun's head was this end, and his feet were that end. So they were both lying there, and in their sleep, <laughs> Krishna had kind of grabbed Arjun's feet, and he was sleeping like this. And Arjun was holding Krishna's feet, like this. And with every breath, as, as Arjun was, <laughs> Krishna, 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 <laughs> Krishna, 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 Krishna. And, and Krishna was holding the feet of Arjun, and, <laughs> Even in his dreams. Like and when Narad Muni saw this, he began to dance. Arjun, Krishna, Arjun, Krishna. What love is there between Krishna and his devotee? And on one side, Krishna's wife, Rukmini, was fanning. And on the other side, Arjun's wife, um, Subhadra. And Draupadi, sorry, Draupadi was fanning. But Arjun has another wife, you know, named Subhadra. How? No, Arjun is related to Krishna. Arjun's mother is Kunti Devi. Kunti Devi's brother is Basudev. And Basudev, many people think that Basudev is Krishna's father. Uh, but at least Basudev, we know, his cousin is Nanda Maharaj, who's really Krishna's father in Brindavan. So Krishna's father in Brindavan is Nanda Maharaj, Krishna's father in Mathura and Dwarka is Basudev. So any, whichever way you look at it, they're either cousins or mm, one... Uh, yeah, removed. It's, it's, it's still cousin brother in India, you know, your cousin, your second cousin, your third cousin, it's all your brother, right? It's the Indian culture. So, uh, so they, they have a family relationship like that. But not only that, but also, when Krishna was living in Dwarka uh, with Basudev and Devaki, his brother Balaram and Akrur and Uddhav and all the personalities, uh, you know, Krishna, when he's young, he lives in Brindavan, it's his sweet pastoral pastimes, but later he became a prince in a big city of Dwarka. So, when he was there, um, his uh, Basudev and Devaki had a girl, and her name was Subhadra. So, now Krishna and Balaam have a sister, Subhadra, and she was coming to the age when it was time for her marriage to take place. So, the elder brother, Balaram, Krishna's elder brother, he was thinking, I really like Duryodhan. He's my, I'm his martial arts guru. I teach him club fighting and everything. So it would be really nice if, if my sister could marry Duryodhan. Now, as you know, Duryodhan is, is the main antagonist in the, on the other side in Bhagavad Gita. 
So the whole family are totally against it. But Balaram is such a dynamic and forceful personality. I don't know if you know anyone like that in your life. <laughs> that people are kind of a little intimidated to confront him over these types of issues. So Balaram's like that. He's really energetic and no one wants to say anything to, uh, uh, about it. But Subhadra's the younger sister, she's not happy. So then Krishna's thinking, wouldn't that be so wonderful if my little sister would marry my best friend Arjuna? Mm -hmm. So then Krishna, he came up with a plan how Arjuna could marry Subhadra. So what he, he went to Arjuna and he said, look, disguise yourself as a sannyasi. So he got Arjuna to disguise himself as a, as a monk, a renounced monk, and set up a little kutia, uh, a bhajan kutia, a place to do meditation just outside Dwarka. So then uh, Krishna went around the, 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 the city telling a few people, hey, there's this amazing sadhu. <laughs> He's doing his meditation, everything, this little hut just outside the city. He's amazing. If, if, if anyone goes and bow, bows down to give pranam and some gifts, some pranami, then all their wishes will come true. So that person told someone, told someone, told someone. And the great, gradually the rumor got back to the palace. And so there in the palace, the rumor came to Krishna's sister. Oh, this is sadhu, he's so nice. If you bow down to him and you give a gift, he'll bless you and whatever you... And she's thinking, I really don't want to marry this Duryodhan. Maybe if I go and visit this sadhu and I bow down to him and give some pranami, then my desire will come true and I won't have to marry Duryodhan. And everyone's thinking, and, and no one knows that Krishna is the one who started the rumor. You know, when, when the rumor came to the palace, you know, this is great saint staying there. And Krishna said, really? <laughs> <laughs> who would have guessed? Maybe I should go myself. <laughs> so Krishna was playing along with his own plan like this. So then one day, it was getting quite close to the, to the, to the marriage day, and the Sakis, the, the friends of, of Subhadra, decorated her in a beautiful red sari. So red is the color which is worn on, on a wedding day actually. And she was decorated very beautifully, and she, she went there, and uh, Krishna came, Baram, some other families were there, but she came and she bowed down uh, to that to that sadhu, and Krishna had put hidden Arjun's chariot behind the, the kutia. And then, at some point, Arjun said, Come with me. And then she realized, Oh, it's the great powerful Prince Arjun, and he's stealing me away. Let's go. So then, <laughs> she was totally into it. Because <laughs> she'd seen him before and she was already... Ar Krishna had noticed, look, look at my, the way my sister's looking at Arjuna. <laughs> you know, so Krishna knew. He already had an idea. So she, she, for her, it was all her dreams came true, really. <laughs> yeah? She was thinking, you know, if, if, if I bow down to this sadhu, he'll bless me that my dreams come true. She, she never knew that this sadhu was her dreams come true. <laughs> yeah? So then Arjun catches the hand of Subhadra, runs behind and they get on the chariot. But then, you know, when you steal a girl from a warrior family, this, is, this kind of wedding is called, there are different kinds of wedding in India, like Gandhava Vivaha and so on. This is called Rakshasa Vivaha. It's, it means kidnap wedding. You just go and you kidnap your bride by force. But in the midst of that, you end up, you have to fight with all of her family members to take her away. So Balaram's there and, and with all the armies, and, uh, and, uh, and the other Yadus are there. They take up their weapons and they're about to, to, to give pursuit. So then a warrior can't drive the chariot and fight at the same time. So they get on the chariot. Arjun gives her the reins and says, you drive, I'll fight. <laughs> so then Subhadra gets the reins and pulls away. This pull away like that. They've got five horses, chariots really fast. So the chariot pulls away. Little young teenage beautiful Subhadra is driving the chariot. Arjun gets his bow and arrows and turns around to face the warriors who are coming. Hmm? So then Balaram, because Balaram, who can fight with Balaram, he's so powerful, he wants to just forget the other warriors in the Yadu dynasty. I'm going to deal with this myself because this is a slight against our dynasty. Okay, Arjun, he's from the, the Kuru dynasty. Arjuna's from the Kuru dynasty, they're the emperors in Hastinapur. Okay, that's okay. But don't disrespect our Yadu dynasty. So Balaram's ready to fight and he got up uh, and, and Krishna called him, sit down. <laughs> Balaram said, but, 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 but. Krishna said, do you, 
you have a problem with this Rakshasa Vivaha kidnapping wedding? You know, how did I marry Rukmini? <laughs> you know the story about Krishna and Rukmini? Krishna kidnapped Rukmini from the wedding. She was about to get married to Shishupal and Krishna kidnapped her on the wedding day. As, 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 you weren't upset when I kidnapped Rukmini. Why are you upset now? So then, Baramba, but, 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 but. then Krishna said, Look, she's obviously already given her heart to Arjun. And when you give your heart, you give it only once. So if you kill him, then your own sister will be a widow for the rest of her life. Do you want that? Baramba, but, 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 but. <laughs> and then Krishna said, Look, if, you, if your pride is hurt, that Arjun, a warrior from another di dynasty, is stealing our sister, then just consider this. Look who's driving. Arjun's not stealing our sister. Our sister's stealing Arjun. <laughs> that is not uh, a matter of disrespect. Huh? Our little sister stealing Arjun, the great warrior. So then... Balaram then he looked at Basudeva and Devaki and Akru and Uddhav and, and they all looked down like this and then Balaram realized, oh, they're all on his side. <laughs> just, the whole family is on his side, just had to let go. <laughs> so, what kind of relationship is there between Krishna and Arjun? They're related more distantly by blood, they're related directly by marriage of his sister, his, you, you know... Krishna is, is, is Arjuna's brother-in-law. So in, in, in Vedic culture, the brother-in-law, Shala, you know, it's a, it's a very funny relationship. <laughs> it's an Indian thing, you wouldn't get it. You know, it's, <laughs> it would take a long explanation. So just the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna is so close, so loving. Right? But who has that relationship with God? God's energy, yoga maya, makes that really because God is the source of everything. You can't be really in that. Way. But God's energy, yoga maya, makes this relationship in the lila to make us all taste love, praying, pure love. So it's late now. We could speak for a long time about the uh, Krishna Arjuna's loving relationship. Perhaps I, if I'll come back again in the future, we can tell a bit more about them. But higher than. We've spoken about the servant's mood, the friend's mood, and then higher is the parent's mood. So very often you see pictures of Krishna as a baby, Bala Gopal, with a with all butter all over his face. And so that's loving God as in a parental mood. And then the highest mood is to love Krishna as a, your Pranavala, as your sweetheart, Madhu Yurasa. And we consider ourselves to be most fortunate that in our tradition all the gurus in our line are infusing those who come to this line with the romantic mood of love for Radha and Krishna. That's the, because each, each prampara, each sampradaya can, is a conduit of divine love, but they're of different flavors. And our particular tradition, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, is giving the access to the very intimate, romantic, loving relation with Radha and Krishna. Thank you for hearing very patiently. So, uh, we have another uh, program tomorrow at Flutsang Farm at 11 o'clock, right? 11 o'clock in the morning, Flutsang Farm. Yes. And then uh, on Tuesday, it's my birthday, there's going to be a bit of a party as well. <laughs> Uh, and it's a Kadasi as well. So there'll be a feast, but it'll be a Kadasi feast. So anyway, so if you, if you can find out from the local organizers if you want to take part. And then, then the next day from there, I'm going to Miami. And we'll be making programs in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So it's not far, just a few minutes away. <laughs> You're welcome to come. And then just, just down the road from Miami, we're going to Bolivia as well. So you go. You're welcome. So you can see, uh, you can go to our uh, Chaitanya dot Academy, Chaitanya dot Academy, and our whole schedule world tour is there. And I want to extend invitation to everyone to join us in in India. Every year, twice a year, we do pilgrimages. So in the month of Kartik, which is like October, November, we do a one month pilgrimage through all the places of Krishna's pastimes in uh, Vrindavan, 
area. And then in the, in the springtime, we do a two-week pilgrimage, and that's in West Bengal, in Navadweep, the places of Chaitanya. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the incarnation of Krishna in this Kali Yuga, who popularized the development of bhakti through singing and dancing, through kirtan. So uh, that's it, one in the autumn, and one in the spring as well. So if you'd like to find more information, you can, you can come and see me and um, take a card and stay in touch and you're welcome to join us in the, well, we have CDs as well, <laughs> commercial break, well. so if you want to get a Kirtan CD, we have some Kirtan CDs here as well, so thank you very much. Um, there will be a very wonderful prasadam for everyone, I'm happy to sit down with you and if you have any questions we can discuss today, tomorrow, the next day as well, and, um, but before we do that, We'd like to have a kirtan. We have kirtan before every lecture and also after every lecture. And there's a reason for that. We do kirtan before because the transcendental discussion is actually not part of this world. And for that divine sound, break, sound vibration to appear here, that's not in our control. We want that divine sound vibration of the discussions of Krishna to come and transport us into a divine space. Perhaps you experienced that divine space this evening. So we do kirtan first to pray for the grace that we experience that. And then at the end of the discussion, we have again kirtan, because there, there may have been things that we heard that we didn't really see with the eyes of our soul. And so when we sing in kirtan after the lecture, the things that we missed while we were hearing, they'll become visible to the eyes of our soul in the kirtan. So, it's very important. Yeah. Go on, pray, Madam.